This is the eLife Open House. Welcome, everyone. I am I'm Jennifer McLennan. I do communications for eLife. Um, while the phones are muted, we encourage you to please um, pose questions using the online interface. So just to the right-hand side of your screen, you can see the opportunity to raise your hand or to, um, to pose a question. So please do that throughout the presentation. We'll answer the questions as possible, but also feed them to the presenters um, when they take a break. Um, also, we have uh, set up the hashtag for um, eLifeOpen. It's pound eLifeOpen on Twitter, and we're going to be monitoring that as well. So if you'd like to ask a question there, please do. So um, it'll be my pleasure to introduce our Editor-in-Chief in just a moment, but I want to, to um, introduce my colleagues as well. Um, Mark Patterson is the um, Managing Executive Editor of eLife. Mark, you're with us. Hi. Yes. Yeah. Welcome, everyone. Ian Mulvaney, Head of Technology. You're with us. Hello, everybody. Andy Collings, Managing Editor. Hello. And am I missing anyone who's with us? Okay, great. So the website, obviously, we're, we're all out there and, and available to help, but um, this is the eLife team with us for now. So um, Randy Sheckman is eLife's founding executor, uh, sorry, um, editor-in-chief, professor of molecular and cell biology at the University of California, Berkeley, and an investigator at HHMI. So, Randy, would you like to take it from here? Very good. Thank you, Jen. Good morning from Berkeley, California. Um, I think many of you have some familiarity with eLife, but let me start with just a very brief introduction. Uh, we, we began a year ago after a period of exploration by uh, our founding and, and funding organizations, the Max Planck Society, the Wellcome Trust, and the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, We've, uh, who were in discussion over a period of about a year, a year uh, concerning issues relating to the publications of their investigators. Uh, they felt, these organizations felt, that uh, open access was uh, the way to go, uh, but they were a, a bit concerned that uh, only a, a relatively small fraction of the literature was published in an open access uh, format. Only roughly 10% of life science publications are in open access. And uh, each of the organizations, in their own way, has been actively promoting open access publication for their investigators. So they felt that there uh, was an inadequate um, uh, opportunity for open access, particularly at the high end. Uh, the investigators of these organizations uh, are, are keen to publish their work in the most prominent journals, and the most prominent journals have a very restrictive space format because they're largely modeled on a print and subscription basis. Uh, and as a result, uh, the success rate at the most important journals is really uh, very low. Uh, Science Magazine, one prominent example, accepts something like only 6% of the papers. And as a result, uh, it's very difficult, and I think many of you have experienced this, very difficult to publish work that otherwise is uh, outstanding in such journals. And uh, the organization felt, and, uh, and I was persuaded as well, that there was room at the top, that, that there was uh, an opportunity for another high-end journal that would uh, favor such publications, but in an open access format where one is not restricted uh, by page length or by numbers of publications. In other words, uh, one could be uh, more expansive in covering the life sciences and yet uh, uh, exercise the very highest standards uh, that uh, the investigators of these organizations, indeed all life scientists, expect um, for such publications. So the organizations then, uh, uh, commencing about a year ago, decided to fund the creation uh, of this journal eLife. They've, uh, we've created a foundation, a separate foundation that actually manages the journal and the founding principles are, A, that the journal will be open access, B, that it will be, uh, uh, rep not, it will be represented by the funding agencies, uh, but will be open to all investigators, all life science investigators, certainly not restricted to the investigators of these organizations, nor will the investigators have any special privileges in publishing their work. They are encouraged to do so, but they are not required to do so, and they will not have any special dispensation. So, it's a worldwide effort. Uh, when I began, my first act was uh, to hire Mark Patterson. Uh, you'll hear from him later. He was the publisher of the PLOS 
series of journals, uh, enormously experienced in the open access uh, environment and uh, really a wonderful asset for us. He has, in turn, built up a, a wonderful team uh, with the headquarters in Cambridge, England, uh, where the journal, um, much of the activity of the journal is taking place. Uh, my next step was to appoint uh, uh, two level, levels of editorial board, a board of senior editors, very distinguished people from around the world, uh, who will serve to first review and consider the, import the importance of papers that are submitted to eLife, and then a very large board of reviewing editors, also of international distinction, chosen on the basis of expertise in particular areas and certainly representing um, not, not just the founding organizations but uh, scientists from around the world. And these people will serve, as you'll see in a moment, in a very um, specific role in the review process. Uh, our goal is to uh, make decisions rapidly, to have a transparent review process, and to have a quick turn time uh, so that manuscripts don't languish for uh, too long uh, before their, uh, uh, a final decision is rendered, and you'll hear more about that as I go on. So we uh, want to put the science and the scientists first um, and uh, to promote the publications of our, uh, uh, of our authors in, in uh, a style uh, and electronic format uh, that is um, uh, at the very cutting edge of, of scientific publication. So if we can have the next slide, I guess I operate that. Uh, our scope is very broad. Uh, we cover from computational biology to clinical medicine and everything in between. Uh, and so we, we we feel we've developed a board of editors that uh, spans uh, quite 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 broadly. Um, we're looking for, as I say, the most important contributions, uh, and we're particularly interested in contributions that have. Uh, impact be, uh, not only in, the, in, in science, but possibly also in medicine. Um, as I've indicated, we, we strive to make the process more efficient. You'll see how we do that in a moment. We're going to exploit digital media, uh, movies, uh, uh, all kinds of additions you'll see in papers that we publish uh, that will be directly linked to the article and, not in, in, and will not require an indirect link. Uh, we hope uh, by our contribution to uh, further promote open access, uh, the goal of the funding organizations is to um, make open access the, the, the preferred model going forward. And we hope by our, not only by the kinds of papers that we publish, but also by our reviewing process, catalyze change uh, in other journals to uh, influence the way that other journals review papers uh, and uh, make the process more transparent. So how will eLife work? Um, I've already indicated uh, that the funders uh, are providing us with uh, generous support so that we can uh, have the, uh, not only an open access model, but have, at least for the first several years, uh, no charges for authors. There'll be no page charges for any authors, at least for three years. And I think going forward, it's likely that the organizations will continue, at least in part, to subsidize us. They feel uh, in doing so, that this is part of their mission in publishing work. After all, these organizations uh, fund the research of many prominent investigators, and they feel that, uh, that they can take on, without too much added expense, the additional role of serving as a direct supporter of a publication. On the other hand, as I've emphasized, our editorial policies are entirely independent of the funders. We have the final decisions. The, we, the the scientific board has make all final decisions, uh, and we are not uh, under any control by the funding organizations. So um, the first level, um, my first task um, uh, last year, late last year, was to appoint a group of very prominent uh, editors. We uh, were very uh, pleased to be able to welcome as deputy editors Fiona Watt, representing the Wellcome Trust, now at King's College in London, uh, and Detlef Weigel uh, at the Max Planck Institute. Uh, they, are, uh, they, along with Mark uh, Patterson, serve along with me as the executive committee making all policy decisions relating to how we go forward. In addition, um, I was delighted to be able to attract some very prominent people from around the world to serve as senior editors. Uh, these senior editors, as I indicated at the outset, 
uh, will consider all submissions. Uh, any submission that comes in will first be vetted by one of these people. They will make the decision about whether the paper uh, fits our high standards of publication and is potentially of high impact. Of course, they can't possibly cover every discipline in the life sciences. So in making that initial decision, they will confer with members of the larger board of reviewing editors uh, to decide whether something is truly a novel uh, contribution. These people have all agreed to spend considerable time uh, on this venture because they feel very strongly uh, in the mission of this journal. And many of them have n not only had distinguished careers in biomedical and uh, general life science, but they also have had prominent roles as editors of other journals. So we bring uh, a great deal of experience, not simply as scientists, but also as journal editors uh, to this task. All right, now let me spend just a couple of minutes describing what I think is a, a, a quite unique path that we have selected to review the manuscripts. And you'll see, for those of you who have experienced this, some, some important differences. The initial decision, as I've indicated, is made uh, by the senior editors. That's not really terribly different from other journals. Other journals, either with professional editors or scientific editors, often have to make that uh, triage decision, particularly for the journals that, uh, that uh, uh, seek to publish the best work. But what happens next, I think, is rather different. Once a paper is selected for review, and we're aiming for something like around a third of our submissions uh, to be uh, reviewed in, in depth, uh, a member of the large board of reviewing editors is appointed to serve uh, not simply to oversee the process, but to actually serve as a principal referee of the paper, him or herself. So that paper is assigned to the board member. He or she um, uh, starts to review the paper and appoints one or more, uh, typically two, ad hoc referees selected on the basis of his or her knowledge of the field. These are people who are not serving on the board, but who are informed of our review process. Each person, each of the two or three uh, people involved in this, then uh, renders an opinion, posts the opinion online, and as the reviews are collected, the referees and the board member have access uh, to the comments of the other person. And once the reviews are all submitted, the referees are unblinded to one another, and they are asked to contribute their comments on the other referees' reports in an online consultation session. This is not a, a conference call, but it's an online consultation session, which allows in, rapid, uh, in a very rapid process for the team of two or three people uh, to uh, consider the comments of their colleagues and to decide which of the comments are most pertinent to the success of the paper. If, as a, uh, as a result of this process, the um, referees and the board member feels that the work simply can't be uh, improved to the point of, of being acceptable for the journal, a decision is made uh, to um, reject the paper with uh, uh, little or no appeal. There are occasional appeals, but most of the decisions uh, at that point are, are final. If, however, the, the collective wisdom of this team is that the paper could be revised, then the board member leads the other two, one or two, in a discussion about which of the comments to transmit to the author. At that point, that board member drafts a single decision letter um, with the approval of the other referees uh, without transmitting the raw comments of, uh, of the referees to the author. The author receives then a single uh, uh, coherent letter with a, a series of steps that the referees feel uh, must be taken to make the paper acceptable. The uh, author then uh, is given time to respond uh, with additional work or by uh, textual changes. The revised version is then transmitted back to the board member who, uh, having served as the primary referee, should be able to render a, de a unilateral decision without taking time to confer with the with the referees who participated in the first uh, process. So we feel by that, but once uh, a paper is judged acceptable, that the process can be truncated and uh, can be done very efficiently within only a few months and not the sometimes endless cycles of papers going back and forth to referees and not 
having to deal with um, with referees who uh, may not have ag- uh, agreed with with their uh, counterparts, since there typically isn't a consultation among referees. So we've gone through this now over the past two months, and generally the the the, um, the findings have been very uh, satisfactory. Both the authors who have had their papers uh, favorably reviewed and the referees who participated in this have found it a very refreshing opportunity that they wish other journals would do. And so we're actually really very optimistic that this is something that other journals can adopt, and we certainly are going forward with this ourselves. Okay. So um, our process, again, then, is to be selective, but we don't wish to be exclusive. We don't think it will be necessary to publish only 5% 5% of the papers because, as I emphasized at the outset, we are not limited by the number of pages uh, or the number of articles uh, that we publish in any given time period. Uh, we are keen to have uh, short papers that uh, report simple but important observations, but we all are also happy to have full-length papers, and uh, we, we uh, emphasize that in full-length papers, we in all papers, we want all the data that's relevant to be presented. We're trying to severely limit the use of supplemental information. We're, we're, we're instead uh, asking the authors to embed that um, what might have been considered supplemental information actually in the text to make full-length articles that are easily read and where the reader doesn't have to click back and forth to find uh, supplemental information. Um, we have uh, on our board um, people who span the range of career experience. Our senior editors uh, are, tend to be very seasoned investigators, but if you have a chance to look at the 175 or so members of our reviewing board, they uh, represent uh, a full range down to fairly young, but not beginning invest, not absolutely beginning investigators. And, and as I said, we're, our, our, our plan is to be speedy uh, and to use this uh, streamlined review process uh, that uh, uh, so far has worked out quite well. Uh, we have made the decision that um, for papers that have a competing effort uh, that happens to be published during the re- re- review process, that we will continue to review and possibly publish papers uh, that may have already appeared somewhere else. So we're very uh, concerned that people... Um, uh, publish things uh, as quickly as possible, but we will not exclude papers simply because of a chance publication of a competing effort, at least during the review process. Um, I've already emphasized these points. Uh, we're going to publish as many articles as we feel pass our high standards. Uh, the article length can be long or short. We're going to encourage the use of rich digital media uh, to include all the underlying data as reasonable within the article. Um, we will limit supplementary files uh, as much as possible to very large data sets that, uh, don't, uh, that aren't compatible with being included in the text. Um, we will uh, have uh, uh, additional features that you'll hear about that add uh, substance and context to the articles that we publish. Each article will be accompanied by an eLife Digest written by uh, professional staff that we've hired. Uh, and they'll, for many of the most important articles, we will commission uh, reviews uh, that speak to the importance of the contribution. Um, we feel very strongly that papers should stand on their own. Uh, we feel that impact factor is uh, not a, an adequate measure of the uh, importance of, of uh, individual contributions. And so we have developed uh, an article level metric system that will allow readers and authors to assess the impact of their own work on a continuous basis. All citations, uh, mentions of articles and other media will be compiled and available to view uh, online as the paper is published. Um, uh, As I said, we are going to um, uh, publish as quickly as possible. During the interim period uh, of the several papers that we've already accepted and before we're ready to launch, We've asked the authors to post their uh, contributions on their own homepage, and in several instances, this has already um, been picked up by the press. We've had very, very favorable press coverage on several of our first papers, and these articles uh, are available to be linked through the author's homepage. And uh, 
uh, within the next few weeks, we're going to start posting some of these articles um, in a completely formatted uh, form that we've been developing, and uh, these then can be searched and accessed uh, by, uh, by the general public. We will use the Creative Commons Attribution License, the most liberal form of attribution license, uh, uh, that is that uh, all content will be freely available and can be used uh, and reused at, at will by uh, anyone who wishes to do so. Um, of, um, within a short time, we will have all of our content posted on PubMed Central. As I indicated at the outset, because of the generous support of our funding agencies, there will be no publication fees for the next three years, possibly longer. We commit to serving the careers of uh, early uh, of young scientists. We understand that young scholars who feel that they have to publish their most important work in prominent journals are under considerable pressure to select only a few journals. Uh, we have agreed uh, that the senior editors and the executive team will write letters of reference on behalf of the first author of a successful eLife paper, uh, excerpting the positive comments from reviews uh, to, to uh, identify the importance that we uh, place on the articles that we publish. Uh, we will uh, provide uh, um, uh, swift and uh, we hope helpful editorial surface, uh, service. The staff is um, committed to uh, making sure that authors have a, a, a positive experience when they publish with us. And we uh, uh, commit also to maximizing the influence of, of, all, of every author's work by uh, publicity, by uh, additional reviews within the journal, and of course by uh, our use of open access. And our use of uh, um, uh, article level metrics we feel will be a, a much better measure of the impact of an article uh, and, and, and we, w we hope not to have to rely, we in fact will not rely on impact factor. We have in fact the advantage over the next several years of being free of having an impact factor assigned to the journal. Uh, and in, in any case, we don't feel that it's a valuable measure of, of the importance of the papers that we publish. Okay, so now um, I think, uh, Mark, are you going to review the um, Yep. Progress for us. <clears throat> yeah, I think I am. Um, I think, Jen, Jen, did you want to introduce Ian, or do you want me to just carry on? I did, actually. Thank you very much. Um, Ian Baldwin, I'm sorry, I meant to say that earlier, with the, having you switch codes and everything was to um, include you as part of the discussion. Dr. Baldwin is one of eLife's 18 senior editors and over at the Max Planck um, Institute for Chemical Ecology. Ian, thanks for coming. I'm glad to be here. And I hope um, when we do get into questions uh, toward the end, um, I hope that Ian and, and all of my colleagues will also help out with those. Um, uh, we are getting some great questions, um, and I'd like to hold them till the end, if that's okay. So um, we are seeing them on Twitter, um, responding there. We're also seeing them on the chat. So um, everyone can stand by for questions toward the end. I'll let Mark take it from here. Okay, thanks very much, everyone. Um, so I, um, my bit is just to, to provide a very short Kind of update in the project to tell you a little bit about you know how far we've got really. Um, so in terms of project milestones, I came on board in, in uh, November last year, and my initial priorities really were to first of all kind of recruit the, the, the team of staff that we need to support the journal and and to and to focus on the the infrastructure that we needed to support the publishing activity and the kind of goals that, that Randy has talked about. So uh, we've made great progress, I think, in, in both areas, and it's essentially we have a full team of staff. Um, if you want to find out more about that team, there's, there's information on the website. We've got about nine or ten folks with a, with a, with a wealth of experience behind them covering a, a variety of, of areas, so it's a, a great team to be working with. Um, we, another priority then was, you know, we had to get a, a, our own independent web presence sorted out, so we launched our first website around March. That was mainly, mostly thanks to uh, Jen's efforts. Um, so in terms of the publishing infrastructure, I'll say a little bit more about that in the next slide, but, um, but you, we, we essentially made the decisions around April, May time, and that enabled us to open up the submissions uh, in mid-June. So... Um, if this, this slide just shows the publishing infrastructure. Um, 
the core infrastructure is shown in the box. So that's the sort of editorial production and web hosting infrastructure. That will be this is probably be familiar familiar names to many of you, but. Um, eJournal Press is the system that will provide the editorial support, uh, the, the uh, system, web system for the editorial process. Um, the the uh, content then gets handed to a production vendor, in our case called TNQ, who are based in India. And TNQ produce the um, formatted content, the XML, the PDF, uh, which is then fired to PyWire that, uh, that will host the content and who we're working very hard with at the moment to, to build a, a, a terrific website. But what, one of the reasons we chose Highwire is, is because um, in terms of the delivery of content, their, their system, their architecture now incorporates an open source uh, uh, system called Drupal, which because it's open source provides us as well with a lot of flexibility in terms of the way we can present content. And you know, given, the, again, the kind of aims that Randy's talked about in terms of you know, how we want to explore explore digital media in terms of finding new ways and, and better ways, hopefully, to present a new research. Uh, Highwire really offered us a, 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 great, uh, a great fit for, that, for those kinds of goals. So, um, and then, you know, at, at, at the top there, I've, I've, I've indicated design by Ripe, because Ripe are the organization who we, who we work with on the initial website. And, they are providing us with a, a, a massive amount of, of really helpful input across the board in terms of achieving a consistent look and feel, but also really helping us as well to think about how we can present articles in a, you know, in what, what I think is, is, is a, it will be a very fresh uh, way of presenting content, a very uncluttered and, and clear way, we hope. Uh, so, you know, that will, that will, that will emerge in time. Um, and then, you know, at the bottom there, you know, we're not just hosting the content on highware. Obviously, this is open access content. We want that content to be present and to be used in multiple locations. Um, clearly, the content will all be sent to PubMed Central, PMC, as Randy has indicated. But another thing we're doing is we're going to make the content available um, in a way which is going to allow computational interaction with the content. So the development community uh, will have a uh, you know, really flexible way of interacting with the content and, and thinking about the content and thinking about ways in which open content can be used, um, you know, which is a, you know, one of the drivers behind the, the whole open access agenda is that the content becomes a more powerful resource. Um, um, for, for knowledge discovery and so on. So we felt it was really important as part of this initial offering to make the content available in a format which would really encourage that kind of um, uh, innovation and exploration. So that's what the infrastructure looks like. And so the, you know, the, the, the pieces are, are, are pretty much in place. Um, and in terms of the sort of countdown to the launch, well, we are looking at a launch of the website on Highwire towards the end of the year. Um, there's still a reasonable amount to be done. We've made a, a lot of progress. But as Randy says, you know, in the meantime, we've started accepting submissions, and we've had some terrific, you know, really terrific content uh, submitted. And, and in some cases, you know, we've got a handful of articles now, which is growing all the time, that have been accepted. We're encouraging authors to make that content available. We don't want, you know, although we're launching the website at the end of the year, we don't want to get in the way of authors communicating their research and the fact that their work's been accepted in e-life. So people are doing that, and that's great. We're going to, as Randy mentioned, we're going to take a more uh, systematic approach to that, hopefully in the next few weeks in terms of releasing the content. Um, um, but in the meantime, you know, we're encouraging authors to post their content on their websites or their institutional repositories, um, and um, and and we'll be also we'll be sharing, you know, with people broadly um, our progress in the next few weeks actually on things like design. So I think as early as a week or two, we're going to be uh, posting a, 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 some information about the PDF design. Um, which is, you know, done essentially, um, and then we'll be posting more information about other aspects of the way we're presenting content, and also some of the policy development as well. Um, so, um, and and you know, part of the reason for doing that is clearly because we're trying to gather feedback as well on some of these some of these ideas. Um, the last few slides is really just to tell a story um, about something that happened recently, which, which, was, which was terrific. It wasn't 
planned particularly, but um, uh, well, it wasn't planned at all, to be honest. But uh, but you know, it was it was a, it was a great thing. Um, so one of the um, one of the first articles to be accepted in the journal was um, uh, Nicole King, the, the one of the PIs involved, presented that work at the Society for Developmental Biology and mentioned that it had been accepted in eLife. There happened to be a science journalist in the audience, and a journalist was, was 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 really intrigued by the work. It's a lovely piece of work. It's about the evolution of multicellularity, so you know, topic of of, of, great, of very broad interest. So she covered uh, the piece in science, the work in science, and then there was a uh, another another um, uh, piece by Ed Young in Discover magazine, and um, and another. What, whoops, what's happened? What's happened to my slides? No, it's there. Oh, oh, there they go. Yeah, and then, then another piece in the, in, the, in the Scientist as well. Um, you know, before all this happened, uh, Nicole got in, in touch with us and said, "You know, is it okay to talk to, to these journalists?" And we said, "Absolutely. You know, that's that, that's terrific. You go ahead." But we suggest you make the content available on your website, on your own lab website, which is which is what's shown in that in that last little insert there. And you know, this was this was terrific, and this is really what inspired us to to say to to all of the accepted authors, you know. Go ahead and post your work. You know this, this is this is this is a good thing to do, and, um, and you know it's it's obviously important as well because it's helping to show the kind of uh, caliber of science that uh, that eLife is attracting, which is clearly something that's tremendously important to uh, to the whole research community. So that is uh, that's about where we are at the moment. As I say, we're sort of building up towards a, a launch towards the end of the year and. Uh, working very hard to achieve that, but we'll be sharing information along the way. Um, so I think that's about it from me, Jen. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Mark. So um, I wanted us to, uh, to collectively just offer a couple of concluding remarks. Um, I wonder if, if Ian, uh, Ian or Andy um, have anything to add to the table. Um, but first, you know, obviously, uh, eLife is, is an invitation, an invitation to get involved in an effort to to create change in science publishing. So um, it starts with the very, very best science. So naturally, our message to authors is to submit your best work, give us a try, uh, take a look at our backing, take a look at the editors who are um, involved in the process, and um, it, invest in eLife. And it, it doesn't take long. Our initial decisions, as Randy described as early on, are within two to five days. So it's a quick decision, and it's free to publish. Um, Mark, Randy, what's your call to action to authors if, if these folks go back to their campuses and, and communicate with their, their peers about submitting an eLife? What's your, your message to them? Well, uh, the, mes the message is that, um, that, that promin a prominent uh, and active scientist will make the, uh, the, the initial decision about uh, the review process, and then all further decisions will also be made by, uh, by peers uh, of, of international distinction. Uh, who will, who will uh, e edit and, and, and generate a single coherent response to the author. And, and we feel very strongly that uh, our review process will streamline and rationalize the decision and uh, allow the best work to be published very quickly. Thanks, Randy. Mark, would you add anything? Well, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a, a, a fantastic commitment from from the from the funders behind the project, but also you know the the, the, the scientists behind the project as well, to make eLife you know a home for for truly outstanding research. And so I think the you know the the, the message is that if your work is accepted for publication in eLife, it will be published alongside other outstanding work. We can begin to see some evidence to support that through you know some of the early papers that are that are that are being um, made available by the authors, and that. You know, I think it's clear from the amount of interest in the journal as well in the past few months, but, but in continuing, that there is an awful lot of attention being uh, invested into eLife. A lot of people are, are watching what we're doing, and so the people who do publish in eLife, their work will will receive, you know, will benefit from that massive amount of attention as well. So. Uh, so I think uh, you know the message is that eLife is a is a you know is the is a fantastic place to publish the, the very best research, and we'd welcome that the submission of such work. Thanks. 
So we've got a, a really vast um, and, and big group um, that got interested in this call and, and came to join us today. Thank you very much. And amongst us are our librarians, and it was my pleasure to work very closely with Scarlet Communication Librarians for the past seven years. So hi, guys. Um, we want to, to work with you, too, to, um, to help to spread the word about this opportunity to help get authors and, and researchers engaged in, in the eLife initiative. So um, please go ahead and contact me. Uh, you know how to reach me. And we're also trying to make materials available through the eLife website that we know will be helpful to you in helping to, um, to start these conversations. So um, let's continue to work together. And then um, Ian Mulvaney and Mark, help me out with this last one because you know we know from the RCP list that lots of publishers have joined us today, um, lots of people interested in, in science communication, but also technology. And um, it seems to me that our approach so far has really been um, you know, pretty collaborative. We're working closely with a lot of different groups um, to inspire our approach and um, to you know to look forward to where we can go um, with science communication in in general. What would your message be to to our colleagues from those communities on this call? So, Jen, this is Ian here. Um, uh, I think I've got really two messages. Um, the first message is the journal, as we launch it in November, will be the first iteration. But we have many plans uh, on improvements and enhancements that we'll be bringing to the article content as we go through 2013. Uh, and the other message I would have is that we're really hoping to be able to use our online journal, uh, our online site, as a testing bed for bringing great technologies uh, that can help people interact with the underlying data and the underlying content uh, in front of many researchers. So those are really my two key messages about the technology side. And I, uh, you, this is Mark. So I'd, I'd just add to that. I think that you, you, as a specific example, we're you know we're we're very committed to the idea of collaboration. You know, eLife is not going to do, you know, achieve all the kind of goals we have on our own. Uh, clearly, um, one of the areas where I think we, we're particularly keen to work with, with others is in the area, for example, that are, of article metrics that. Um, uh, that Randy mentioned, and you know, there's a whole community of people who are doing tremendous work in that space, and um, you know, eLife would is committed to being a part of that community and really helping to drive forward that agenda because we think that's a really significant and important one for research communication as a whole. Uh, so that's just one example where we, we we're very keen to work with others. Great, thanks very much to you both. Um, so we've got um, just about 15 minutes left. Um, I'd like to just take a look and see if there are any questions on the chat or Twitter feed that we've met, missed. Um, and uh, if we dry those up, then we can certainly open the phones and give that a try. But um, Mark, Ian, Andy, um, would you give me a hand and take a look at these feeds and see what we're missing? Um, here, our first question right off the top here is from Richard Seaver, who asks, if authors will be able to request particular editors are not assigned to their paper. Randy, is that a good one for yeah, you? Sure. So. Uh I'm happy to answer that. Uh, authors are given an opportunity to uh, indicate which uh, board members or referees they would uh, prefer. They are also given an opportunity to exclude board members or referees. And uh, we often l use the advice on the positive side to, uh, of uh, board members or referees, and we always uh, honor any request that a uh, uh, that a particular board member or referee be excluded from the process. Great. Thanks, Randy. Um, Ian, I'm not sure if this is a question for you. Um, Joanne came in, uh, something about reagent sharing and reagent access. Now, that, I, I, that would be a policy a decision that I can speak to. So uh, our policy uh, will be very clear. If uh, an author uh, develops a process or has a biologic uh, that is described in the paper, they must make that available to, uh, to a, a qualified uh, a reader. Uh, I'm particularly concerned about clonal reagents, antibodies, strains, anything that was essential and developed and published in a paper must then be made available to the community. Thanks very much, Randy. Um, Mark, um, 
We've been asked if we have envisioned what the publication fee might be after the initial period. You know, it's really it's really way too early to to to, to say at this point. I mean, you know, we we haven't even launched yet. Um, you know, and as Randy said, the we're not going to to introduce publication fees for at least three years. Um, so, um, you know, it's just it's just way too early to 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 to, uh, to provide any you know, to be able to say anything sensible about that um, at this point. But I, I think going forward, I, I want to say that uh, I'm quite confident that our founding organizations and possibly other foundations will see the value of what we're doing, and will uh, will the some of the funding organizations will provide support for us. So I, I believe we will have uh, a significant support even after three years. But but it, we can only guarantee the first three years will be free of fees. Thanks, Randy. Um, Ian, you want to try this one? Um, Natalie Wilder asked, and I think we missed it on the feed, um, in what format are articles published? Uh, the, the, ground to... truth will, the ground truth will be NLM XML 3.0, and that will be rendered into a number of different instantiations. So it will be available um, as HTML, uh, it will be available as PDF, uh, it will be available through JSON API. Um, uh, there is a small chance at this point, though it's not clear yet, that it may also be available as EPUB, but I wouldn't count on that for the end of this year. You did get that. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm, I'm scrolling through the questions here. So, um, Kathy, uh, Ian, forgive me if you're hitting these online as well. Um, Kathy Carr asked if articles would become available as they're added online, as in not on a volume issue basis and if it goes into PubMed immediately. Yes. Yes, we'll be posting our articles as they're uh, accepted and processed uh, with, without reference to a particular issue. They'll, they'll come on, maybe maybe we'll have once or twice a week in new articles that have just been processed. Okay, here's a good one. Um, Will referee uh, comments that we may have mentioned this earlier, but David wants a repeat. If we um, will referee comments be published with the papers yes. in the way that MBOJ yes. does? Yes. So uh, our policy is that the uh, this, the initial decision letter, that is the unified letter of comments written by the board member in consultation with the referees, will be published uh, then uh, for papers that then obviously have a successful response, the author's response will be published after that. Thanks, Randy. Mark, um, Andrew Miller highlights our reference to community partnerships. Um, would PLOS be a choice for partner? Well, I, you know, I think the, the best example of that right now is it goes back to that comment I made about um, metrics, to be honest, because um, you know, PLOS has really been the, uh, the, 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 the leader in terms of publishers um, in, the, in the area of article metrics. Uh, they introduced them in 2009 um, and have done a really tremendous job. They've made the data freely available uh, through an API and so on, and you know, they've really done a, a, a terrific job. They're hosting um, a, uh, a kind of event for developers later this year, so we'll be participating with that. So yes, I can see us you know, we're collaborating, very much collaborating with, with PLOS, say, in the area of, of article metrics. So I think that's a, a pretty good example. Thank you. Now, um, Brian Vickery at the MC raises a, a really good question that we've been talking about internally, and that's, you know, where does the DOI come in if we allow, um, you know, our authors to deposit their accepted manuscripts on their websites or in their institutional repositories? Do those have DOIs, or when does the paper get assigned a DOI? Good um, so, so the paper will get assigned a DOI on acceptance, and uh, the DOI will, as soon as we're ready, will always point to an instance of record for that article. So I, think, I think that's probably the most I can say at the moment. We are looking to support sub-article DOIs as well. Um, yeah, I think, that's, I think that pretty much, I hope that covers that question. So the, the sub-article DOI means that you know individual components of the article will have their own um, child DOI as well, so that those individual components can be 
can be cited and linked to as well. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, Ian, you're all over the chat, so I'm not sure if we have other questions um, uh, to, to, to miss. Thank you very much for keeping up on those. Um, here's one, though, that was just addressed to me. Um, Guy Reeves asked if it'd be possible for ELEC to consider manuscripts that have been submitted for peer review in parallel to other open access journals. So, Mark, do you want to take that one? I'm not sure if it's, if it's asking if it's been submitted at the same time. Is under review at two journals at one time? Well, that's that's just generally considered, uh, you know, not not good practice, regardless of, of publishing model. You know, you you don't submit the same manuscripts, to, the same manuscript to two journals at once. It's it's just uh, sort of, you know, sort of violates the principles of, uh, of 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 the way the way publishing works, really. And it increases the burden on referees. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's just not uh, not fair. Okay. Um, Andrew Miller, you're making me work double hard here. I wish you were on the online chat. So, um, okay, good question and good roundup, actually. So, um, uh, Randy and Mark, maybe you could take this one together. And um, unless there is other there are other questions, we can make this our conclusion. He asks, "What's the measure of success for eLife?" Well, well it's a very sub very subjective. Um, but uh, our feeling is uh, initially that if the members of the editorial board, the senior editors and the board of reviewing editors, were willing to commit to, to send us their best papers, uh, and uh, if those papers then really are judged by their peers to be outstanding, that that would be uh, one measure of success. We're, we're not giving them any special privileges, but we do feel that if our, if our, if our board members, who are all of them prominent scientists, feel strongly about this journal, they will be willing to send us their best papers. Uh, and uh, I've been on many other journals, on boards of many other journals, where that such a plea has been made in the past, and I found uh, that that usually falls on deaf ears. However, I can report uh, that we have been very gratified uh, that some of our first papers have been uh, contributed by board members, and they are uh, often, but not always, judged by their peers to be outstanding. So I, I, I take that as an as an early indication that we are on the right path. Uh, going forward, uh, I think we'll once again rely on the judgment of our senior editors, who have broad experience and know quality when they see it. Uh, and uh, we will be selective, but not uh, not capricious in our decision making. And I think um, we've already set the bar very high. And people, as we display our work uh, in the next several weeks, we'll see the, um, where that bar is. So, so this is my, if I could add a, add a couple of points, I, I completely agree with Randy, of course, that first and foremost, it, first and foremost is the quality of the content that matters above all else. Um, so, but beyond the content, I think, you know, the, one, of the, one of the broader goals of V-Life in general is to be catalytic in the sense that we we hope that we can, what we do can, um, the kinds of experiments we do and the kind of things that we, uh, the kinds of in innovations that we introduce will inspire other changes in research communication more broadly. And obviously, you know, one of those areas is open access. We're, we're part of a, a, of a community of publishers who are advancing the, the, the ideas and the standards around open access. And so one of our measures of success would surely be and advance more broadly towards comprehensive open access. And similarly, you know, advances in or improvements in the way research assessment takes place, that that's another central goal because it's, I think it's so important to, to, to innovation generally in research communication. And, and also some of the ideas around the reform of the, um, the, the peer review and editorial process. You know, we're not alone in experimenting with these areas, in these areas, of course. Um, but, uh, but you know, we hope that, that whatever innovations we come up with will be helpful more broadly and will inspire more positive change elsewhere. So I think, you know, content, absolutely, right at the beginning, but then there's a whole set of other areas where we would hope to, to, a, to see a, a broader a, a improvement and advance in research communication. Great. Thanks very much to you both. Um, I think this is a good place to close.
Um, we we see you, everyone, on Twitter, and um, and would love to continue the dialogue there around this event or any other questions you have about eLife. Um, uh, Ian and I could probably lurk on the online chat for a few more minutes if you have questions there too. Um, but otherwise, you know, I invite you to contact us anytime. Our email addresses are, are all listed on the website, and the feedback from the community has been really, really crucial um, in helping to um, inform the direction that we've taken, especially with the the editors, of course. So. Um, Randy, thank you again for doing this. Mark, thank you very much for doing this. The whole eLife team, thanks for being a part. And to everyone who joined us today and took uh, time to learn about our project, we appreciate it. Thank you. Mark, hey. Randy? Thanks. Thanks, Jen, for organizing this.